Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer's retirement. By now, you've probably heard the big question, who will succeed him? What will his or her nomination process look like in the Senate? We'll touch on those questions, too, in just a minute. But I think there's a bigger question we should answer first. Who is he? How is he shaping the nation's highest court? What's his legacy? And what kind of void will his retirement leave? Stephen Gerald Breyer was born in San Francisco to a middle-class Jewish family. His father was a lawyer and public school administrator. His mother volunteered for the city's Democratic Party and for the League of Women Voters. Stephen Breyer studied at Stanford and Oxford and Harvard Law School. Not bad. He was also a professor at Harvard. President Clinton appointed him in 1994, and the Senate overwhelmingly confirmed him 87 to 9. Today, he is the eldest justice at age 83. Justice Breyer is one of the court's three more liberal members, but that does not mean that he operates as a partisan Democrat. Over the years, he's built a reputation as a pragmatist. And in recent years, he expressed more concern about partisanship threatening the court's legitimacy. That was a focus of his latest book called The Authority of the Court and the Peril of Politics. He especially opposed court packing. That issue resurfaced among some Democrats after the Senate confirmed Justice Amy Coney Barrett in 2020. Justice Breyer warned against letting politics tarnish the court's authority. That authority, like the rule of law, depends on trust. A trust that the court is guided by legal principle, not politics. Structural alteration motivated by the perception of political influence can only feed that latter perception. Joining us now is Jeffrey Rosen, the president and CEO of the National Constitution Center and a professor at the George Washington University Law School. Earlier today, he published this piece on The Atlantic called The Court Loses Its Chief Pragmatist. Professor Rosen, welcome to the program. Good to see you again. Great to be back. Talk about that idea, the chief pragmatist. What does that look like in practice on the Supreme Court? Justice Breyer believed that the law should work for people, and he was willing to make compromises if he thought the institutional legitimacy of the court required it. So probably his greatest legacy was behind the scenes. He and Justice Elena Kagan worked with Chief Justice John Roberts to uphold the Affordable Care Act, and it involved a kind of deal Roberts would vote to uphail, uphold the health care mandate, and Kagan and Breyer would strike down the mandatory Medicaid ex expansion. And some people thought that that was unprincipled. You just, just follow original intention and, and let the heavens fall. But Breyer understood that unless the court is perceived as legitimate by Americans, then we lose our faith in the rule of law and the whole, Republican, the, the whole republic collapses. So that's why his vision was unique it was much valued, it was much needed, and the fact that that pragmatic voice is gone will have real consequences for the court. Well then, Professor, what do you make of this notion? I know we just fomented it because that's what we called him, but this idea that he's one of the court's more liberal justices. How does that left-right dichotomy actually factor into the way the Supreme Court does its job and the way that we think about who his successor might be? Well, that's the crucial question. And he was indeed generally a reliable liberal vote. And this term, where we see a bunch of the six to three decisions that Breyer abhorred in abortion, uh, in voting rights, in gun rights, maybe next term in affirmative action, you see that when push came to shove, in most cases that liberals really care about, Breyer did vote with the liberals. Uh, and he will be replaced with a liberal. But, and of course, in the end, that's not going to change the balance of the court. And this six to three majority is going to prevail in these really controversial cases. But Breyer's difference among liberals was just his willingness to work with conservatives to try to bring them into the center. And Chief Justice Roberts bought into that vision. And now that that's gone, and the court is about to hear all these incredibly polarizing cases, we see a greater risk of the six to three decisions that Breyer most feared. One of the things that Justice Breyer was known for were not just decisions, but dissents. Here's part of his dissent in the case, parents involved in community schools versus the Seattle School District 
from 2006. He wrote in part, quote, the last half century has witnessed great strides toward racial equality, but we have not yet realized the promise of Brown, meaning Brown versus the Board of Education. To invalidate the plans under review is to threaten the promise of Brown. This is a decision that the court and the nation will come to regret. I must dissent, unquote. Professor Rosen, talk about the value of dissents, especially the ones that he wrote. They were hugely important. I got the chance to interview him for the course for uh, high school students, the civics course that the National Constitution Center teaches uh, online. And I asked him last spring, and he said the dissent you just read was one of his favorite opinions uh, of all the ones he wrote. Another involved the death penalty. And he thought they were crucial in calling future generations to account and ensuring that the law would change in the direction he thought was right down the line. That dissent you just read mattered a lot to him because, as you said in your intro, his dad worked for the San Francisco public schools. And that experience gave his father and Justice Breyer a trust in democracy and public education as something that could work. He thought fairness, uh, racial equity was crucially important. And he thought that schools were a place where people of different backgrounds should work together um, on equal terms. So that kind of summed up his democratic idealism. And he hoped that his dissent uh, will be vindicated at some time in the future. Let me ask you about the future of the court. A Gallup poll recently found that only 40 percent, 40 percent of Americans gave the Supreme Court a positive approval rating that is significantly down, down 21 points from what it was back in 2010. Joe Biden, while he was on the campaign trail before he won the presidency, talked about the Supreme Court in September of 2020. Here's part of what he said. The only rule I've ever followed relating to the Supreme Court nomination was the Constitution's obligation for senators to provide their advice and their consent to a president's judicial nominee. But he created a new rule, the McConnell rule. Absolutely no hearing, no vote for a nominee in an election year, period, no caveats. And many Republican senators agreed with him. Professor, we know that there's a lot politically riding on this for President Biden. President Trump was able to nominate a third of the current justices to the court, three justices. Joe Biden has said in the past that he wanted to nominate a black woman to be on the Supreme Court. Then there's also the concern about trust in the court. Alexander Hamilton said in the Federalist Papers he thought the judiciary was going to be the weakest branch. You know, it, it doesn't have powers of the purse. Its job is just to call balls and strikes and, and say, yep, you're right, no, you're wrong, and that will be the end of it. And that is not what has happened at all in recent years on the court. What do you think is at stake in terms of whoever Justice Breyer's successor will be? Well, on the one hand, a huge amount is at stake, and I'm so glad you called out uh, the great Alexander Hamilton. Having neither person or sword, he said the court depends only on public trust to have its judgments enforced. And that was exactly Justice Breyer's point as well. He was very Hamiltonian in that respect. And those legitimacy numbers you read are very troubling for the justices themselves. As you said, they're in the low 40s now. They were nearly 60 percent just two years ago before Justice Ginsburg passed away. And this term, it's likely that we're going to see an overruling or substantial narrowing of Roe v. Wade, followed perhaps next term by an overturning of affirmative action. This is a legitimacy crisis for the Supreme Court. And unfortunately for uh, the country, President uh, uh, Justice Breyer's successor is not going to change the numbers. Uh, he, President Biden, no doubt, will appoint a superbly qualified black woman, as he said. But in the end, that's just three liberal votes, and that's not going to prevent the court from polarizing if it chooses to do it. So it really, it's up to the remaining justices. And the question is, do enough of them continue to buy into the vision of pragmatism that Chief Justice Roberts embraces and that Justice Breyer embodied to prevent the court? from polarizing so severely that it severely damages its democratic legitimacy. GW Law Professor Jeffrey Rosen. Professor, it's always good to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joshua. Now let's hear from Justice Breyer himself. Back in 2018, I had the honor of interviewing him on stage at the Aspen Institute in Colorado. He talked about his legal philosophies, the future of the court, and reluctantly about when he might step down. Law is complicated is what it comes down, down to. It's uh, uh, pragmatic, it's adaptive, 
uh, it proceeds slowly uh, over time. And, and if you're a judge, you have to look at cases and you have to read the words. What you are deciding in a case is not just for these people in front of you, nor just for the judges who probably have come to different conclusions about it now. It will last. It's for uh, the other judges who will have to follow what you say. It is for lawyers who will have to explain it to clients. It is for clients who will, in fact, have to live with it. And indeed, it's for a lot of people who have never seen a law office because they will be affected by it. It's complex. That's the idea. And there will be change. If there were no change, we're frozen to death in the 18th century or earlier. And if there is too much change, people can't adapt. They don't know how to leave their lives. And that's why we have principles that say, go slowly. When you do write a dissent, how do you view your role as a dissenter on the court? What's the value to you for posterity of being someone who says, yeah, that's what the majority thinks, but I, that, I think they're wrong, and here's why? That is a very, very good question. And uh, there, there are different kinds of dissent. And the best kind of dissent is you're writing a dissent to try to convince someone who it's tentatively, because it's always tentative until the last minute, on the other side. And you're saying, you see, see it this way. See it this way. That's why. And nobody who writes an opinion likes to look like an idiot. So if you have a good argument there, they'll change it. And how much will they change it? And to what extent? And will the whole thing change? And that's always up for grabs. And so the best kind of dissent is where you feel you're doing that, you're going to point something out, and you have a hope here of at least a major change for the future, even if they don't join you. I wonder where you see this intersection of civil rights, civil liberties, First Amendment protections, minority rights as the court deals with it and, and thinks through it. Where's that going? You do decide things case by case. You don't plan out a general direction. That's really not the job. Now, of course, if I've written, I've written, uh, for example, uh, uh, a long dissent uh, on the question of whether uh, certain immigrants should be given bail. Now, the court didn't decide that. So if that comes back, I'll probably start anyway with what I've already written. And so the, naturally, in that respect, a particular case about a particular thing, uh, you, you have a direction. But in general, the job is, and this is where I started, you take the case. And that's the primary job of the Supreme Court. Iron out the law where the lower court judges have, have uh, uh, come to different conclusions. And you have to keep in mind that we approach these big deal cases, you know, as the press would call them, uh, the same way we will approach a case that is about the comma. I mean, you think you know the answer. I've opened the brief, the blue brief, which is telling me why they're wrong below. I read the question. I think I know the answer. Then I read it. Yeah, I did know the answer. Then I read the bread brief. Oh, <laughs> oh, perhaps it wasn't as clear as I thought. And then I read the yellow, the blue, yellow brief, the reply brief. And then the government might send a brief in, which is gray. The government's always gray. And then we might have light green for you, you, any group that's for the petitioner, or dark green for the respondent. And by the time I'm finished reading them, I then go to my law clerks and I say, these are the problems that are bothering me. Write a memo and put in anything else you want. And I'll read the memo. I'll talk to my law clerks. And then we have oral argument. What do you want us as the American people to keep in mind about the court, the seat, the process? One thing is that this document is tells, it, it, it lays out some frontiers. Some of them pretty important frontiers, free speech and so forth. But uh, within those frontiers, which are broad, people make up their own minds. And that's why you don't like what's going on. You go to the ballot box. I'm afraid that's for almost everything. For those Americans who look at the court as this vast, immane, untouchable structure, and you within it, and wondering, well, what's that like? Who is he in there? 
what would you say to them about your future on the court? I'd say that I'll do my job as long as I think I can do it properly. And under the human being, that's, that's, it will become apparent, I think, to me, that uh, uh, as it does to people as they get older, uh, that this seems to be about the right time. It was such an honor. I'm so glad I got to talk to him. That was part of my conversation with Justice Breyer from 2018 at the Aspen Institute. We'll share out the rest on social. You can find us at NBC Now tonight. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.